Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the boardroom with Dr. Reiner Canisi on the telephone. Hi, Reiner. Hi, everybody. I am so happy that you're here, and, and we've managed to get through the, uh, the hardest part, which is the technical uh, setup of uh, conflicts and scoring and rules and overview and whatnot. Now we can have some fun and talk about how you uh, develop this game, and I can sit back and be a fan now. Uh, so where, where does it all start? I mean, it, 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 in a way, it's very difficult to talk about game design because everybody has a different uh, method. So I think taking the example of Tarkers and Euphrates is, is an ideal one just to see one way, and it's, it's, there are many different ways, but one way how things can develop. Of course, Tigers and Euphrates is a relatively involved game with lots of background strategies and, and therefore lots of uh, thematic uh, links as well. When I decided to start on that game, and that was early in 1995, uh, I, I really had the intention to do an epic game, something which has depth, which has historic depth, uh, and which has uh, a, a reasonable playing length with very different strategies you can apply. Uh, I, am, I, I think, in principle, there are two different approaches and two, two different, in a way, types of people. Uh, there's one type, which are the, the storytellers and the ones which uh, create a lot of uh, information in a game and a lot of individual rules. Uh, and there is the other type, which is more the scientific type, and I think I'm a scientist in this way, who take a rich story and draw out the, the basic principles and try to get very simple basic principles into a game and uh, see that the depth develops out of, this, out of these principles. And both ways can be very successful. As I, my strength is more on the scientific side, I always need to start with a very rich theme and do lots of research, uh, do a lot of reading, because then I will have a, a very rich... Uh, theme and background of which I can then pull out the individual rules and the individual um, episodes I want to take. So with respect to your friends and tigers, that meant for the first six, eight weeks I did nothing but read about this, the theme, read about the topic, and particularly tried not to think of specific game mechanics because that already leads you down one path and you add one thing to another and you are down one route which you don't want to go too early. And you want to stay open. Exactly. So I did a lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of, lot of, uh, watched some films which were related to that, and got every every material I could could get about it. And um, and once I knew enough about the period, then I thought about the basic mechanics behind it. And uh, it, it's so very often in, in game design that essentially what you do is you you come up with one or two or three good basic ideas, and these core ideas will either work or not, and then you build the other stuff around it. And the, the core ideas which were there from the beginning onwards were that there are leaders, and these leaders belong to the players, and the players can have different leaders in different kingdoms, and the leaders will actually be the means to score points through whatever goes on in the kingdom. So that was there very, very early. And the second part, which was there very, very early, was the scoring system, that you make points in all four dimensions of the leaders, and the weakest result of these four dimensions will be your score. Of course, that's... That's still the heart of the game. Uh, there was a lot to be built around it. I think one of the key steps in the beginning was that I had a map which allowed you to place your tiles only in specific directions, so along a line or along a, uh, a column, and you didn't have the free freedom to place the tile wherever you wanted. That worked out to be too restrictive until I finally saw that it wasn't an overkill when you were able to place it everywhere. So that was one of the big milestones I saw when I developed the placement placement uh, rules for the tiles. I mean, there were there were lots of things which evolved. For example, the the rivers originally were along the edges of the tile of the of the spaces, so that you could be on either side of the the river in a way and could still do your agronomy there. I and see. in the course of the game, it turned out that there were too many spaces and it didn't quite work like this, so I, I changed that. Uh, my one of my main obstacles when I went into that design and had the first prototype done was the game had far too much material in there. So it played about three to four hours, which for <laughs> me was terrifying because I have never had done such a long game and it was very, very complex to test it 
very complex to really see through all the mechanics. So it means when I, while I did the initial testing for that game, which was in, in summer 1995, uh, I, for, for about three or four months I did not touch any other game because just the brain was so filled up with this one that I couldn't get anything else into the game, into the mind. Now, with this respect, it was exceptional because usually I work on several games at the same time, but this one needed the full attention. And I, I, I just looked through my test protocols because I keep notes of everything I, I develop because I can then go back and if I need to change things, can can get all the, the, the experience, the history out of the game. And the first, the first test game was actually played on the 23rd of August, 1995. So that was <laughs> about three months after I started the studies and came then to the prototype and looked at the individual rules and finally made the, made the first test. So the first test was on the 23rd, uh, and that uh, led to lots of problems. So essentially I sat down and changed it. We played it the next day again on the 24th. I saw that many things do not work. I went into a complete redesign and we had an already very much changed version on the 29th of August, and we changed, tried it again on the 30th, and again it didn't work, and I had a very complete reworked version again, which was then the free version where we, we didn't have to go along the lines on the 31st. Uh, that's very unusual. I mean, when I talk about versions, that usually means it's a major redesign, not only the tinkering around the edges. So in, in this specific situation, doing all the studies, with respect to the background material, and then going into how should the rules look like and calculating stuff and analyzing stuff in my head until I finally arrive at the prototype was one thing. But then because the material was so complex, uh, the prototype did not work in, in many of these individual corners, so there they had to be lots of principal readjustments. But as I mentioned, the, the main thing was the game was too long. I had too many features in there. And I'll give you some examples. Okay. I had the possibility to become a dictator in one of the kingdoms. And that meant one of the leaders would take over all the roles and would get all the income. And the dictator could always, all, all, always only be uh, the, the military person. The military person has in the meantime disappeared. So I had a dimension in there was, which was the military, and they could get mercenaries and they could get armies behind them. And in this dimension, uh, it was simply if there were more military titles in the kingdom than there were religious titles in there, then the structure which we have now, everything based on religion, broke down, and the one leader, the military leader, took over, and all the other leaders did not have any power anymore. Remarkable. What a different game that would have been. <laughs> Yes, it, it was a very different game, and I mean, and I had something like this in every dimension. For example, on the the farming side, I had a link over to the people. So the people are now black, with the king, and the farming is blue. And I had the rule: if there were more people than there was farming tiles in the kingdom, then they didn't have enough to eat, and therefore they would start a revolt, and therefore some people would starve, and the leader would be kicked out, and the kingdom would actually quite be. Be, be shaken from the inside. And of course, historically, that would have been very accurate. That would have been very accurate. Now, one of the challenges in developing a game and trying to make a kind of a model also, or some a reflection on, on the historic development is to select what you can take and what you cannot take. The problem was not only that the game was three or four hours long, the problem was also there was a lot of counting involved. Because you had constantly to count how many people do I have, how much farming do I have for them, how strong is the leader uh, against the religion, and it was, it was very mathematical. And I decided I didn't want to have this, and therefore what I did is I, I phased these things out. Uh, particularly, I didn't want to put it into the region of a war game anyway, so I tried to keep the war dimension out and only have it come indirectly, because of course war was important for that period. And I tried to bring in the more positive stuff, and that was when the idea of the monument developed, and say, oh, that is actually something three-dimensional which can grow on the board. And, of course, with the monuments, I can link several dimensions because they become two-colored, and that then seems to be the right, the right way to go. And, and through all this, it it's all kind of comes together by simplifying y your global picture of how you had planned to design this 
and keep bringing it in tighter? Yeah, I mean, for me, there are always two phases. One, the first phase is before I have a prototype, that's uh, the, the initial uh, ideas and rules where I need to make sure that I get a lot of innovative rules. It's always easy to, to have one or two or three principal ideas and then to fill the rest with, with standard stuff and you get a game which is half standard and half innovative. I think oh. the big challenge is every gap you have, everything you need to solve to solve it in a, some kind of a new way and also in a way which is in harmony with what, with what you already have. And the major part then of the testing is to really see if that all flows naturally and it's somewhat intuitively. Yes, of course, if I didn't know how to do it, I would do it this way. And to also make sure that the rules remain relatively simple because it all follows the same system. Some people call that abstract in a way because uh, they try to have a lot of varieties and they have 10 different things and the 10 different features all work differently. And it's, it's just a different philosophy. You can do it and you get a very different game with lots of rules, lots of complexity in there, but in my eyes, and that's my personal view, is in my eyes, this complexity actually keeps you almost a bit away from the game because you need to master all these rules. I want to give you easy rules, but then give you the challenges that there is a depth of play through these easy rules. Well, I have to tell you, 10 years ago, I would have told you that I would have liked to play the first version of this game. Yeah. But as, as, I, as time becomes very precious, and, and my friends seem to agree it's this type of a game that we can complete in one to one and a half, maybe two hours, yeah. that, that is so satisfying because it's so rich in strategy and yet plays in two hours. Yeah, yeah I mean, for me, I, I, for a long time I had the saying, uh, a, a game which is longer than an hour is unplayable. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was in a, in a jokey way, but it is that my preference is when I sit down in the evening and play games, I'd rather like play two or three games, if, if I want the same one, but I have a new chance to get in, in, in something involved in something new, then play the long one. But that's very much a matter of taste. But oh. as that is my preference, that's also impressed, expressed, of course, in my game. Reiner, in the few minutes we have remaining of this episode, I, I'm just wondering how all this ties into what some people consider a trilogy of what you've done in these, yeah. in these uh, games that we've mentioned in some of the previous episodes. How does all that relate, or does it relate afterwards more than uh, during? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting point, because uh, Tigris and Euphrates was finally released in Germany two and a half years after I started the initial development uh, by Hans and Glück. That was in Essen, 1997. Uh, and uh, that was the first game of this trilogy, as people call it. Now, the interesting point is, I never designed it as a trilogy. I never called it a trilogy. I've never seen it as a trilogy. That was purely made up from the outside where people looked at it and said, oh, this is a trilogy. That was always planned. There was, it was not planned <laughs> in a conscious way. However, I think there is a bit of truth behind it because when, you, when I go into a new field of design, and that's with respect to Euphrates and Tigris, that was a lot of exploring new territories. Then, of course, it's like opening a new drawer, developing a new network. And with this network, you see another dimension of games. And that means when you go and do a, a, a different type of game, you then have a very rich field in there that you can draw from. And therefore, I think Tigris and Euphrates, in a way, was the kickoff in, in my mind to have, have, have essentially paved the path to go in this direction. And it makes it easier for me to do the other games. And therefore, the, the other two, uh, that is uh, Through the Desert and Samurai, then followed probably along the path which I had already explored. Of course, it's very different mechanics, but also as a tie laying game. It's, I think it's, this is something which I sometimes am not even aware of, but if people, on a very, very global level, people only know few, very few games. So they know a card game, and they know a word game, and they know a board game. And so every board game is like Monopoly, and every word game is like Scrabble, and every card game is like whatever is the most famous card game. So true. And only when you dig deeper, you see differences, and then you see, oh, there are actually 20, 30, 50, 100 different card games, and they all look very significantly different, like with the board game. And I think the, the deeper you go, the more differences you see. And I think if I go into a new development, I then see by doing one game, lots of different strategies, which I also can do in this environment. And in this respect, these trilogies and these groups develop more in my subconscious and then come out as, in a way, an expression of one development period in which I am. 
I was just thinking that that a lot of this might might be a subconscious or a, a, almost an unconscious tying together of the three uh, games that we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, it, you see, for me, it is very important how the how the game feels when I play it. So I don't really look at the rules. I don't compare with the rules of the same. For me, it's the feeling. How how do I experience the game? And the rules can be very similar. The game can be very very different. And that's what for what what counts for me. Well, there couldn't be two games that, in my opinion, are, are so different as uh, uh, Through the Desert and Tigris and Euphrates. To me, they have a completely different feel. Uh, and, and, I, and I've come to enjoy both very much, two of my favorite games, I must say. Yeah, they are two different ways to explore how you lay tiles. Once it's camels, but they're still tiles in a way. And then, of course, these different cultural tiles in Euphrates and Tigers. Very different. But it is this concept. You have a board and you fill the board. Of how many ways can you do it? That's, I think, what I started to explore with Tigers and Euphrates, yes. Well, I, I do want to let the audience know you can always go back and catch that uh, previous show that Reiner was uh, gracious enough to do with us on Through the Desert. It's still one of my favorite games, if not the number one favorite game. Although this one, as I play it, uh, is getting close. <laughs> yeah. Again, Reiner, I want to really thank you for spending the time with us uh, for these shows. And in fact, I want to thank you for uh, agreeing to do one more, which is kind of a look into the future. You're and, very uh, welcome. It is a pleasure. Uh, we'll get a chance to do that very shortly. I want to thank everybody for watching. I hope it was as much fun for uh, you as it was for me. I promise uh, I had a great time. Again, thanks to Reiner. And uh, for Reiner, my name is Bob Schwartz. You've been watching The Boardroom, and good evening.